Morning, church. Morning. It's great to be back in Nebraska City. It's been a while. I'm thankful to be here, and I sure hope you are as well. I see, obviously, a lot of familiar faces. Didn't remember everybody's name, of course. Scanned the picture board out there and tried to remember some. And It's just good to be back here in an atmosphere of love and fellowship, an atmosphere that loves Jesus and uh, loves to get into the book. And if you're visiting this morning, sorry you got to put up with me. I'll do the best I can. I'm thankful you're here too. We're going to look into the Word. I want to touch on something David said the way I introduced my class this morning. My theme is about conversion, and there's a reason for that. I'll start it off the same way just so I keep up with myself here. I, I was born September 23, 1952. You all have your birthday as well. But there's a date that's more important than that, and Dave alluded to that. And for me, it's today, August 7, 1974. That's the day I was born again. Amen. So I'm 42 years old in the Lord, and you have your date as well. And, you know, knowing that that was the date that Larry had asked me to come to speak, and I thought, you know, I, I want to do something with that. And, you know, when, when anybody speaks, and I've said this before, and you've probably heard it, I mean, I speak to myself first. When I look into the book, I let it talk to me. And obviously I want it to talk to you as well, but I can't make it talk to you. I can't make you have the want to. I can't make you do anything, and you really can't make me do anything in my heart. I just hope your heart and your mind's open, so as I share some things from, from the Word and from my experience, that they'll help move you closer to God today. We talked about some things in the book of Acts, some, some conversion stuff there, some, some information that people needed to learn, and some, some practical application that's there. And I want to build on that as we think about our day of conversion. I don't know how many in this room have been born again of the water and the Spirit. I know we'll have an invitation at the end. The baptistry is always ready there to go, and there are men and women here that will study with you appropriately, and there'll be an opportunity for you to make that commitment if you haven't. But be that as it may, I want us to think about those of us who have been converted and, and given our life to Jesus. I want you to think about some things here and hopefully be reminded of when you made your commitment to Jesus and not only that time, but how you've come since then. And, you know, we can't change what happened this morning or yesterday or all the years gone by, but we could change from this point on. And so that's really the exhortation here this morning as we go through some scriptures to think about, okay, how can I do better now? And where can my focus be? Where does God want it to be? Again, this will probably just be a reminder for most of us. You'll know the texts. We're going to talk about what was read to us about being a new creation. God has done his part. He always has and he always will do his part. He is a God of promise. He'll be there for us. It's simply up to us to do our part, and that's why the Second Peter 3 verses were read. It's up to me, it's up to you to grow in the grace and the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. It's up to you and it's up to me to, to guard myself so that I'm not led astray, like verse 17 said, by unprincipled people. And boy, they're out there everywhere. Bottom line is, we're going to look at Peter today. Look at some verses in 1 Peter and 2 Peter mainly. 2 Peter will be our text. 2 Peter chapter 1. But I want us to remind ourselves of something that's really encouraging to me. I like the way Peter words this in 1 Peter chapter 1 when he lets us know what God has done for us because he loves us so and how it is that we are indeed a new creation. 1 Peter chapter 1, let's begin in verses 3 and read through 9. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who according to his great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to obtain an inheritance which is imperishable and undefiled and will not fade away, reserved in heaven for you, you who are protected by the power of God through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this, you, you Christian, greatly rejoice, even though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been distressed by various trials that the proof, proof of your faith being more precious than gold, which is perishable, even though tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. And though you have not seen him, you love him. 
And though you do not see him now, but believe in him, you greatly rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory, obtaining as the outcome of your faith the salvation of your souls. What a mouthful of words Peter writes here. We are saved. We're born again. There's no trial, no, no, no struggle that we go through. We're not trying to make your situation. Don't know what it is. Try it by any means. But there is a God who is there, a God who gives hope. And I hope that since you were converted and since that time and now that you are experiencing that hope that God wants you to have, God will do his part. And I love the way he says it in verse 8. He's writing to Christians 2,000 years ago that never knew Jesus. At what generation this was, I don't know. must have been the second generation maybe later in Peter's life before he passed. But it's the same thing to you and I. He says, though you haven't seen him, you love him. And hopefully you and I could say the same thing. I haven't seen Jesus, not with these eyes, but these eyes I have, the eyes of my heart, and so have you. And boy, do I love him. He puts up with me, and he puts up with you, and I know you know that too. Let's, let's get into Second Peter now, chapter 1, just to build on the same thing about God doing his part, and then we're going to spend the majority of the time talking about our part. Start in Second Peter 1, verses 3 and 4. Well, let's start in verse 2, I guess. 2 through 4, 2 Peter 1. Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, seeing that his divine power has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness through the true knowledge of him who has called us by his own glory and excellence. For by these he has granted to us his precious and magnificent promises in order that by them you might become partakers of the divine nature having escaped the corruption that is in the world by lusts. God has done his part in Christ to redeem us. He saved us from ourselves. He saved us from the corruption that's in the world and all that that implies. This world doesn't offer us eternal life. Only God through Jesus Christ does. You know that and I know that. But boy, are we tempted. Boy, are there stuff, is there stuff out there, and especially in the day and age we live in. It's all about making choices and making right choices, and you know that and I know that. What I want to do now is we talk about conversion. I wanted to deal with the idea of conversion and growth. We talked about the initial things in conversion and some things that were there in our Bible class. But now I want to challenge myself and challenge you to think about applying verses 5 through 11. Good list here. You'll be familiar with it. You've studied your Bible before. And if you haven't, I want you to, to be encouraged by our, our revisiting these verses and Make some notes in your mind, if not literally on paper, and, and use this as some devotional stuff today and this week as you think about your walk with God and if indeed whether or not you are growing in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Here we go. Start in verse 5. We're just going to walk through this list in a very simple way, not going to give a whole lot of detail. We'll make some comments, though, just to, to challenge us. Here's what we do now. Here's what conversion is about and what growth is all about. It's about commitment. God has done his part. I've said that. What's my part look like from Peter's text here? I have to make a decision. If I'm going to grow, here's what I'm going to do. Verse 5. Now for this reason, this very reason, what he just talked about, God's grace in our life, God helping us and so forth. For this very reason, also applying all diligence in your faith. Here it is. Obviously, number one, we have to have diligence. We're in the faith, he says, supply moral excellence. What's moral excellence? Some translations say moral virtue. Some say other things. But the first thing I need to realize is that when Jesus came into my life and he came into your life, it was to save us. Save us from something. Save us from all that's wrong. We all know the story of our first parents, Adam and Eve, and what they unleashed, the death that they unleashed. We've talked about that in years gone by. You've studied it on your own, too. There's a curse in this world that we can't take care of. We need outside intervention. God has done that in Christ. Through Jesus and modeling his life, we've learned how to live and how to love, and we'll talk about some of that as we go on here. But the point is, how do I grow since I've been converted? I've got to make the decision continually to learn about moral excellence, to educate my mind and my heart in a world that's so opposite. We live in a world that wants to define life as anything goes. 
In so many arenas, there's really no moral virtues other than what people think on their own. We know we don't live in a vacuum or in a void. It's not a matter of whether we have values. It's a matter of whose values. I, I don't need to go through all the depressing stuff going on in our country now, though I'll touch on some of it. You know, all, all the definitions of morality and about gender and about identity and all these things. Do we have enough wisdom here to make the choices about what the Bible says about these matters? Or am I trying to, you know, not only help myself, but as I try to help other people and be sensitive and at the same time be wise and be bold, be humble, yet be very out front with what the Bible teaches? Have I put moral excellence in my life? Is that something that's serious to me? We know that Jesus died for our sin. Dare we make a mockery of him by saying that, yeah, Jesus loves me and I can do whatever I want? Or have we come to the realization we have to make the right choices? There's a song we sing to our kids. I don't know if you sung it here. I've never been around your kids' stuff. I, I love watching the kids sing it. It's... Be careful, little hands, what you do. You know that one? Be careful, little feet, where you go. Be careful, little eyes, what you see. Be careful, little ears, what you hear. Maybe we could build on that. Why don't you sing that to me? Why don't we sing it to one another as adults? Don't we need to hear that message too? Don't I need to be careful what I say, what I do, where I see, where I go, and who I have relationships with and how I think and on and on it goes. Isn't that not be part of becoming like a child, being converted, Jesus would say in Matthew 18? I need to be serious about this idea of moral excellence. And Peter wants us to be. Let me just move on here to the next part. Add to your moral excellence knowledge. We touched on some of that this morning. We all know, especially in the day and age we live in, with computer stuff and information out there, information is power. Knowledge is power. I don't know what career fields everybody has here, but I know where I work, there's a certain amount of things I need to know, or I could hurt myself or hurt somebody else or, or whatever. And, you know, you understand that point. That we all know that there's a certain amount of information that goes with different industries, different uh, career fields, as I alluded to, much more so when it comes to our soul salvation. Hosea would say it this way in 4.6, My people perish for a lack of knowledge. And when you read on in the text, it's a leadership problem there, not giving out the right information. What's my point? I have the obligation, you have the obligation to listen to this book. This is the creator of the universe allows us to have this book. God is speaking to us through this book. His spirit has energized this book. 2 Peter 3.16 and 17 still says, that this is a God-breathed book, that all Scripture is that. It is inspired by God, and it is profitable. It is beneficial for teaching, for correction, for reproof, for training in righteousness, all that's good and right, so that the person of God will be fully equipped for every good thing, every good work. What's the point? It tells me what I need to know here about who God is, who I am, about people, about relationships about how to have relationships, about how to make choices, so on and so forth. You know these things. We live in a world where there are no such things as absolutes anymore. There are no solid reference points. There's all kinds. So many fall into the category where Paul would write Timothy in 2 Timothy 4, verse 3 and 4. You know the verse. He writes about what was getting, beginning to happen back then. He said the time would come when people would not endure, hold on to sound doctrine. But here it is. But wanting to have their ears tickled, they would accumulate teachers in accordance to their own desires and turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to, to myths. What's he saying there? You and I as human beings just want religion our own way. We want definitions our own way. We want values our own way. Don't tell me what to do. Don't tell me how to do it. That's how we are as humans, unfortunately. But see, you and I know that because we're Christians. We have a different mind. We have the mind of Christ, Paul would write. We've also got the mind of the world because we've been there, done that. And we still understand it because we're still living with it. We're still struggling with it. 
But we've got two minds, you see. And we've got a book here that will feed that mind and keep us on that straight and narrow path if we believe it and apply ourselves to it. We touched on it this morning where Jesus said when he was tempted. You know what he said. A person does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Soul food. I need it. You need it. Moral excellence, knowledge. Then what does he say here? Into your moral excellence, knowledge. Into your knowledge, self-control. You got that one worked out? Self-control is opposed to being out of control in whatever area, whatever area of our life it needs to be controlled. How we speak, how we act, how we choose, what we do with our bodies, what we do with our habits and hobbies, what we do with our money, what we do with our problem-solving situations. On and on it goes. May God help me. May he help you to understand God wants us to be people of control. All through the Proverbs, you read about the fool or the, or, or, or the person that's out of control, sticks his foot in his mouth, or I do that, but I repent too, or just you know, can't handle situations and wants their own way. The point is, Peter writes that we need to be people of control in every area of our life. Let's, let's support this with 1 Peter 1. Another thing here that uh, goes with reference point in the idea of self-control. Peter says in verse 13 of chapter 1, Therefore, gird your minds for action. Keep sober in spirit. Fix your hope completely on the grace to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the former lusts which were yours in your ignorance. But like the Holy One who called you, be holy yourself also in all your behavior. Because it is written, You shall be holy, for I am holy. Yes, God's a God of love. Yes, God wants to give grace and mercy. But He's also a holy God. He's a God of wrath. He's a God of jealousy. He's a God that has the right to demand. And you and I have the obligation to obey. Just like it says in Genesis 1, 26 and 27, that when God made the man and the woman, He made them in His image, it says. You and I are made in the image of God. Of course, we know the story. It got messed up. And we're dealing with the struggle ever since. We still have the obligation to get refocused. And if we've been born again, and if we have been converted, our lifelong journey is about becoming more and more like God and understanding what it means to be holy. Holy simply means separate. Separate like God. is separate from that which is evil, that which is defiled, that which is sinful, basically. Again, we live in a world where there are no values, as I touched on. We live in a world that wants to define anything anyway. All right, let's get down to another area here, another attribute in my dedication to growth. Add to your self-control perseverance. Patience. I've been around some very, very patient people, and I've been very, very impatient in my life in many ways. This is not a pick and choose list I'm giving you and me here. We're to be about all this together in our lives. If I'm very serious about growing in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ, I need to grapple with, am I a patient person? Am I somebody that's trying to keep trusting God, keep dealing with situations in my life, or am I somebody that loses self-control, forgets about the knowledge and information I have, forgets about God loving me, or am I really trying to persevere Look what Peter says back in 1 Peter again. Let's pick up the reading in verse 12 of chapter 4. <clears throat> Obviously, if you've read Peter, you know that he's writing to Christians who are going through various types of suffering, various types of persecution. Life is just no fun for them. Being a Christian is one that... Uh, is a red flag to the world around them, and they're going through a lot of different persecutions. Look how he words it here. My translation says it this way, verse 12 of chapter 4. Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal among you, which has come upon you for your testing, as though some strange thing were happening to you. But to the, to the degree that you share the sufferings of Christ, keep on rejoicing, so that also at the revelation of his glory, you may rejoice with exultation. If you are reviled for the name of Christ, you are blessed, because the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. 
By no means let any of you suffer as a murderer or thief or evildoer or a troublesome meddler. But if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not feel ashamed, but in that name let him glorify God. For it is time for judgment to begin with the household of God, and if it begins with us first, what will be the outcome of those who do not obey the gospel of God? And if it is with difficulty that the righteous is saved, what will become of the godless one and the sinner? Therefore, let those also who suffer according to the will of God entrust their souls to a faithful creator in doing what is right. Persevering. Life will not always be fair. Life will many times be tough. I don't, uh, uh, Dave mentioned the sports thing and made me think of the Olympics. I caught some of it. And on the PBS station, uh, one day this week, I caught the tail end of obviously being Olympics week. They're doing past Olympic stuff. And they talked about the Olympics in 1936 that was in Berlin. And they talked about a, a man's rowing team from Oregon. But just like they were doing if some of the people, some of the countries that were being represented this year, this year's Olympics down in Rio and, and some of the people, this 1936 Olympics, they did some profile of some of those people. And you talk about hardships. Talked about some of the, 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 the birth and the life of some of these guys that were on the rowing team. The, the family rejection, the being passed around, the, 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 the poverty, the, the, the rejection in many areas of their life. And you'd think if, if anybody had a right to give up and be mad at life and mad at people, some of these people would be. And it's no different than that today in situations. What's my point? Life's not always fair. Life's going to be tough for all of us. And I know I've said it before. I've got to say it again. I don't want to make your stuff be trite because I don't want you to make my stuff be trite. I've got stuff I go through too. But I know I'm not going through anything like Jesus went through, and neither are you. But even if we do, let us glorify God. Let us persevere. Let us hang in there. Let us keep on keeping on. Because even if we live to be as old as Methuselah, 969 years, and I believe that, even if we live to be that old, and he did. He's been gone now for how many thousand years? We're still going to pass into eternity. We just need to endure and know that heaven's going to be so sweet. That's exactly what Paul said in Romans 8. For I am persuaded that all the suffering of this present age cannot be compared to the glory that's going to be revealed to us. We need to have perseverance. Moving on here, we've got a couple more to go through, and I'll wrap it up. Add your perseverance, godliness. You know, and looking that one up in the, my Vines Dictionary again, I mean, it, it seems more kind of like the, the idea of, you know, moral excellence, but it's a little different. It, it, it reflected the idea of a, a Godward attitude in everything in life. Godliness is also a piety, but it's one that's because it's trusting that God is in control of everything. It's believing that God is the one that is sovereign and God is the one that deserves all glory and credit. I don't know what your worldview is on many things, but there are many worldviews out there, and we've touched on some of that. There are many people out there that uh, oppose and pervert and twist uh, any proper religious understanding of thinking or behavior. We don't have time to read Second Peter 2, but you mark that one down. Peter gets into that for back then 2,000 years ago, where people are perverting this idea of what real godliness is about. For you and I, we need to have a Godward attitude. We need to be doing those things that are seeking to please Him and trust Him. That's part of my Christian growth. Two more and we're about done here, and then we'll wrap it up with the summation. He says, add to your godliness, brotherly kindness, and, and love. I don't know, you know, we've talked about this before, and I know you've studied some of it too. In the New Testament Greek language, there were four words for love, three that are used in the New Testament. Two of them that are used here, this idea of brotherly kindness is the Philadelphia love. It's the familiar love. It's the, it's the social love. It's the finding things in common love. You know, I remember years ago hearing an old preacher preach, and he says, you know, you don't got to like everybody, but you got to love everybody. Well, I kind of know what he meant by that. I don't like everybody. I don't even love everybody, and I know I should. And, you know, sometimes people don't like me. And they're, they're just their personalities we have. But as it's up to me and me doing my part, I need to exude. I need to give brotherly kindness. I need to seek that, 
that social familiarity and, and wanting to be with people. I don't want to be one where I want to be so liked by people, I become like people in the wrong way, but I want to be somebody that reaches out to people and, and has the right kind of social skills. I don't want to be a competitive person, a person who is selfish and is jealous and prejudiced and everything else. I don't want to categorize people that way. I want to look at people as not just who they are as a fallen human being like me, but who they can be. Because that's what God did to you and me. Yeah, I could see people's faults as like they could see mine. But we're to be rescuers and helpers of people. We're to be the kind of people that could look beyond the faults and see the potential in Christ that every human being has because that's what God did for you and me. That's what brotherly kindness is all about. The last one here is love, and that's the word agape, which is the love that's not based on any kind of feeling. I think I've shared this one with you before as I, as I talk about agape love. Sometimes people, when I say, how do you define love? It reminds me of a quote that I got from one of my counseling books years ago, a guy named Wright. Somebody Wright wrote the book. But he says, so many of us think that love is defined this way. You ready? Love is the feeling that you feel when you feel like you got a feeling you never felt before. It sounds more like lust to me. Uh, is there feelings involved in love? I think in Philadelphia love there is, as well as agape love. But agape love is not motivated by how I feel or how I think. It's motivated by what I know and what the need is. That's God's kind of love. God so loved the world that he stepped into the picture. God had every right to do another Genesis 6 and just wipe us all out. But God took the initiative. I need to have the kind of love that will allow me to touch people's lives. And we know that biblical love is both a noun and a verb. It's just not lip service, but it's where I, I do the best I can to use my talents and abilities to reach out to people and to help people and do for people. And I get frustrated because of limited time and limited resources, and so do you. We see a situation, we see a need, and there's only so much we could do sometimes, so we're left with one thing. That's intercession prayer for people, you see. Like Samuel would say, when the children of Israel chose a king and were complaining to God and complaining to him, and he wrapped it up by saying, Far be it from me that I should sin against God by ceasing to pray for you. Hmm. I remember when a preacher preached that years ago, I thought, I need to hear it that way. If I don't want to pray for somebody, i got to look at my attitude. Sometimes that's all we can do. So what have we seen here briefly this morning? My conversion is about growth. I need to grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. God has and is and will always do his part. Am I doing mine? Am I striving for moral excellence? Am I striving for biblical, based, solid, absolute knowledge and reference points? Am I trying to be a person of self-control and getting all my appetites and thinking and life in the right kind of patterns? Am I hanging in there? Am I keeping on, keeping on? Am I persevering? Do I have a Godward attitude, God, in this? Am I loving right? with brotherly kindness and with agape love as well. Let's wrap it up with verse 9 through 11. 8 through 11, excuse me. For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they render you neither useless nor unfruitful in the true knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. And then here's an admonition. Here's a warning. Verse 9. For the one who lacks these qualities is blind or short-sighted and having forgotten their purification from their former sins. In other words, having forgotten your conversion, having forgotten when you were born again, having forgotten the commitment that you made to God because of the commitment He made to you. Let's don't be there. Verse 11. Or, excuse me, verse 10. Therefore, brethren, be all the more diligent to make certain about His calling and choosing you. For as long as you practice these things, you will never stumble. Wow. I stumble because I'm not practicing those things. For in this way, the entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ will be abundantly supplied to you. God makes a promise. You and I have made a promise to him. We just need to keep it. I don't know where you're at here this morning, spiritually. I just know where you need to be. Same place I need to be. That's in a faithful, growing Christian relationship with God and with his people. Brothers and sisters, you know what we do the invitation for. It's an opportunity for us to get something off of our chest, so to speak. 
Maybe something's been said here this morning. Maybe you've brought something with you this morning and you know you need to get some things resolved. Or maybe you just need some prayer because you're struggling. Whatever that need is when we have a song here in just a second, please, please let somebody here know what you need. If you need to make it public, please do that so we can help each other. We are forever family here. We're brothers and sisters. We're here to help each other. And you know, again, I don't know you that are here that maybe you're just trying to investigate. Maybe you are for the first time hearing some things about Christianity you've never heard before. In our morning class, we talked about some initial things of becoming a Christian. The information you learn about Jesus being the God who became incarnate, a human being. He lived that life as the miracle worker and teacher, that lover of people. He went to that cross because of our sin problem. He arose from the dead so we don't have a grave problem anymore. We don't have to fear the grave. He ascended back to heaven to be that go-between for us, that, that lawyer, that advocate between God and us, that high priest. And he's coming back one day. If you believe those things and you, what you need to do then is be willing to let Jesus be the Lord of your life as well as your Savior. And then as I alluded to earlier in the New Testament, once people heard that message and were convicted in their heart of it, they were baptized. I point of the lyrics, I know there's a Baptist here. Do I need to splash the water? Is there water in there, Dave? Okay, thank you. I knew there would be. If there's not, if it's broke, we'll go out to the crypt. Bottom line is this, in a very serious way. I don't know what your relationship with God is like. But if you need to make a response by either having prayers for strength to become more faithful or making that initial response to be born again of the water and the Spirit, we're here to help you today. So whatever that need is, let it be known as we stand in sand.